welcome, Jazz Heroes. I hope you are just as tired as I am, and I hope that you just as much want to go home as, as I do. But unfortunately for you, I prepared a lot of content for you. So, uh, yeah, so, so Flaki is a short of Ishman Smojanski, which is like explains why he's Flaki and not Ishman Smojanski. Um, I'm a, I'm, um, a Muslim tech speaker, as you can see from the blue hoodie, and you know we have you have we have seen a bunch of others here uh, already uh, running around and uh, teaching you lambda calculus and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm a Muslim tech speaker. I'm also a like a consultant and front end trainer. I work with the Mozilla Developer uh, Relations team, uh, mostly on community management and events. And in my free time, which is you might imagine, like it's probably pretty much non-existent. Uh, basically, I'm um, doing JavaScript hardware stuff. So if that's your kind of thing, uh, then hit me up. And we're going to be talking about the approaching the JavaScript singularity. Sarah was like, "Flocky, what the fuck is that?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, I was like we can put it in a different way. It's like the burning questions of the JavaScript ecosystem." But yeah, so, so this is basically uh, what we are going to be talking about. And the story really starts in um, 2008. So we're going to take a memory trip back to 2008 when V8 was released. V8 is the uh, JavaScript engine that uh, uh, Google, the open source JavaScript engine that Google created for their Chrome browser. Um, in 2009, uh, this led to the creation of Node.js, and like that's Node.js is 10 years old, folks. That that is that is a lot. And I think there is a, like another pivotal uh, pivotal moment uh, in the history of um, what we are going to be talking about, and that's 2013 ish, uh, which led to the um, Lake Clark already mentioned this. An engineer at Firefox decided to optimize JavaScript in a way that nobody before optimized it. And eventually this led to the creation of WebAssembly through like the evolution and collaboration of uh, web browsers. But let's just go back to that 2008-ish uh, and just like, you know, give, give a bit of thought about, uh, you know, what happened to JavaScript around that time, uh, especially around that time. And uh, what you're gonna see is the Sun Spider benchmark, which is, um, you know, which came around a bunch of uh, years ago. Uh, when people started to um, try to figure out how to make sure uh, make the uh, uh, how to make the uh, JavaScript ecosystem kind of like a a test for the ecosystem to figure out which browser or which JavaScript engine was the best, uh, and you know as, as as these things would evolve and devolve, it uh, as anything else devolved into a fight. Uh, 2008, uh, the release of the V8 engine kind of sparked a, something that we call the third browser war. And uh, JavaScript engine uh, uh, speed started increasing like in an exponential manner. And it didn't stop until it reached like well close to like native speeds. Um, with the help of ASMJS obviously, but uh, the technology kind of kicked off this, this, uh, this war. But it also, it, what it kicked off is what I already mentioned, uh, is a great divide. Uh, because uh, a perform like JavaScript never was meant to be performant, uh, but the creation of JavaScript, uh, the V8 uh, JavaScript inter uh, engine, actually m uh, made it uh, fast enough that people wanted to uh, you know try to explore other ways to to do JavaScript. And the important piece of that is um, that JavaScript was universal enough and isomorphic enough, and this was basically the two hardest words I'm going to be pronouncing today. Uh, that people wanted to use it all over the place, and when it when it became like fast enough, they did it. And you know, uh, I I I hate to steal uh, Hayden's thunder, but we're gonna be talking a lot about people using it like in very weird ways. So please excuse me. Um, but uh, the very interesting part is uh, Jeremy Keith recently tweeting about this, and Remy Sharp tweeting about this. Like what? Uh, basically, the key. P uh, part the key position of this is like because it's JavaScript, you can use it all over the place. You can use it on the server side. You can use it on the client side for your front end. You can use it for um, for side generators or uh, or build tools. And the very reason uh, this is very interesting is because uh, you can reuse the code that you create and then the skills that you learned. And this is what basically eventually pushed like JavaScript into the realm of like everybody wanted to do everything with it. 
Um, let's talk about Node.js because what started this whole everybody wanted to do everything with JavaScript was probably Node.js. And um, Node.js enabled like server-side code, uh, enables like uh, serverless functions. Um, uh, if, when you are running serverless, you're still uh, and using uh, JavaScript, you're still using a, a Node.js runtime. Um, it enables uh, s a static site generation uh, uh, um, uh, 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 and a bunch of tooling that we, we, we use today. So it is clear that that JavaScript uh, and like the, the front end as we know it wouldn't be in a point when uh, when Node.js wasn't haven't been invented. Uh, but this is kind of the question of you know um, uh, raises the question of you know uh, there's this gif when you are like uh, you were so preoccupied with thinking that you could that you didn't think to stop to stop to think that whether you should and. Um, uh, what what came out of this this is the great divide, which is basically the Node.js platform kind of became its own like silo, and the web platform itself came, became its own silo itself, which meant you still wrote JavaScript on both sides, but the, the JavaScript was not interoperable. And you know, like all the all the tools that were coming out of that uh, were trying to like like bridge this divide between the two ends of the uh, of the JavaScript ecosystem. And the bigger problem uh, is that uh, with that is actually that these gaps, these problems, were actually unbridgeable for a bunch of reasons. Uh, because the two platforms had very different, um, a very different purpose in mind, and were created with very different restrictions. That meant that you know uh, the Node.js side missed the secure sandbox that uh, the, uh, JavaScript was. Uh, 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 very famous of you could you would have unlimited uh, network and file access native modules you could execute files right left and right over the place and still Hayden's non-existent bitcoins and uh, the, this kind of like created a fissure between the, the the boundaries of these systems because like the web um, uh, the web still focused on being like a secure uh, uh, there is a reason they call the browser a user agent it, uh, the, uh, the browser is supposed to be working for you uh, so this kind of created a fissure between the two systems and when people when you try to do something on the on the on one side you, you run into like problems and like limitations uh, if you did no JS you are like oh I have like all these security problems and like cross origin policies and all that sh and when you went to the the server well you were you were, uh, you were faced with a bunch of like security problems and issues that uh, the overzealous like permission um, uh, uh, of uh, Node.js uh, created. So what comes, you know, with, with great power comes great vulnerability and we already heard about the uh, stealing of your bacon and uh, Rust had this line in uh, when Rust, the Rust programming language was uh, was still in its infancy, it has this line in the uh, in the website that, you know, uh, it is very beta, so Rust could do any kind of things, including eating your laundry, and like kind of Node.js is the same, like it could eat your laundry if you don't uh, don't look out. And there are mitigations and, you know, there are ways to like circumvent these issues, you know, you can just write all your code yourself, like uh, uh, some of I, uh, us try to, but that's also not sustainable. Uh, so the, uh, there's a uh, blog post by Jake Archibald, but a bunch of others came out uh, recently uh, that tell you that uh, it's not just your the Node.js part that, that's a problem, but all the third party dependencies that you are using. And I, I, uh, but I, I cannot go into too much detail of this, but, the, uh, but it is kind of, you can kind of see it that Node.js was inevitable. Uh, as uh, as soon as the uh, JavaScript ecosystem got fast enough and uh, like people figured out ways to do it, people wanted to do more with JavaScript. People wanted to put JavaScript uh, into all all kinds of places, uh, and so eventually, like Node.js was on the first uh, thing that that came out that was running uh, JavaScript on the on the server side or like tooling, uh, but it was the the one that made this thing popular. So. If you want to learn more, I'll link the blog post on this. Um, but basically, what we can see now is like 10 years past, and what we can see is Node.js is here to stay. Uh, nobody's uh, arguing with that. But also, the web is also here to stay. So they kind of realize that this kind of chasm that is between the two platforms uh, is causing a lot of developer churn. Right? Like you cannot reuse the same tools, you cannot reuse the same same items that that you usually used to be using. 
so they kind of started merging together and, and bridging those gaps between the, um, uh, the, uh, the languages and the platforms. And Dishaw had like a great, uh, uh, Dan Shaw had like a great uh, presentation about this. Uh, I also linked you. Uh, but the, well, what we are kind of seeing these days is like there's like a convergence between uh, the, the server side platform and the client side platform. So uh, uh, what you see on the, on the, on the uh, slides is of one of these experiments when Node.js started implementing a, so Node.js has always been like single threaded, uh, but uh, that was ways to do like multi-threaded code when you fork a process or like, like start a cluster or something like that. Uh, but sometimes you just wanted to put some code into like some JavaScript into a separate thread so your main thread would remain uh, uh, empty. And you could do that on the web, but you could never do that like easily on, on Node.js. So that what they were like, hey, that actually sounds like these workers thing uh, uh, that we have on the uh, web platform sounds pretty cool. So they basically made like a, a copy or like a, a inspiration, took, took inspiration from it. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a great talk uh, exploring how they got there and, and why they exactly got there. But workers is not the only thing that has been coming into Node.js. Like you can see, um, uh, uh, just in a few months, uh, there's a talk coming up at JSConf for you that is uh, Joey Chung is going to be talking about all the APIs that are currently landing in Node.js that are exactly and especially aimed at like developers uh, have ca being able to reuse the the things that they have been using on on like the web platform and like kind of trying to bridge this gap between the two platforms. Um, uh, the issue with that is. Um, so, so there are like uh, there's a native fetch implementation because because uh, most of you probably like ran into wanting to use fetch on the Node.js uh, side. Uh, there is like uh, various other like DOM like mi m m minimal libraries and like other things that make sense on the server side. So they are like, hey, we're just gonna take this and put it into the server uh, or like Node.js. Uh, and there's also WebAssembly and ES modules, which I'm gonna be talking a bit more in detail about uh, because I think that's an important. Uh, uh, problem of the JavaScript ecosystem, and there's probably something that you've been running into uh, quite a lot. So let's face it, uh, code separation in JavaScript has not really been easy uh, for a long time. I mean, there was it was pretty much non-existent. Uh, this is a, a picture from Lynn Clark's article that I link in below uh, when the uh, code is looking for the jQuery global. Uh, somebody forgot to implement it in Lambda uh, calculus probably. Uh, but the uh, the thing is, like, uh, uh, Node.js took, uh, like, there were, like, uh, various, like, um, various companies and various, uh, like, efforts try to create an ecosystem uh, of packages or, like, like code sharing for, for JavaScript. Uh, but really, it was, it, it's easy to see that it was Node.js and CommonJS was that, the, that really uh, took this bacon uh, and took the home run. Uh, the red line that you see is the number of JavaScript modules uh, in the NPM registry compared to like .NET, PHP, Ru Ruby, Py uh, Python, and a bunch of others. Uh, but but Node.js wasn't like, Node.js was a bit too late. Uh, so by that time, like I said, everybody tried to to solve this their own uh, their own way. And you know, uh, AMD existed, so people tried to figure out how to universalize like the all the the, uh, the different methods people could use for this, and like uh, various loaders and like code generators and code like um, uh, code code tooling appeared uh, that was trying to tackle this problem. And we had a lot of you know, conflicting uh, conflicting resolutions to this issue. Uh, it kind of caused a mess, and that mess. Um, a lot of a lot of pe 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 people disagree whether CommonJS helped with that mess or like even further intensified it. Uh, this is Alan Wirtzbach. Uh, uh, he was basically the editor of the ECMAScript specification uh, until and uh, until they shipped the uh, ES6 or uh, if you more like it ES2015. Uh, but he was basically editing the uh, the ECMAScript uh, specification. While a lot of people are, are, are moaning about how Common JS was really messing uh, things up, I mean, Common JS is literally just, hey, I take your code, slap some some headers in front of it and, and back of it, and just evaluate it as text, uh, and create a function out of it, which is like, pfft. Uh, and and it was not very complex, and a lot of people complained that it, it probably should have been more elaborate. Uh, 
Um, in, in this tweet, uh, Alain disagrees, but everybody is, uh, can decide it for themselves. The mess is already made, however big it is. And, but the ECMAScript specification has, uh, well, it took their time, but uh, they actually figured out the, uh, the S ES6 module syntax would probably uh, be able to solve this, uh, trying to clean up this mess. And if, uh, how many of you are using uh, ES modules already? Okay, so who is uh, who's using it natively and not webpacking uh, shit out of it? See, that's that's uh, like that's like fifteen hands out of the half of the room. So you could use it, like all browsers support it, but there is a problem because uh, because Node.js didn't support it. Uh, you still have to, and also like you have like other uh, things that you might want to do with it, like uh, code split and whatever your bundles. Uh, but here's the thing: Node.js didn't support it for a long time. Uh, until uh, Node.js v10 rolled around and they started implementing an um, experimental native syntax for, for ECMAScript modules. Now, a lot of these churn, a lot of the arguments are coming from the part that uh, the standardization organization, like yes, modules were created without the understanding and like without like taking into account what Node.js really wanted. Uh, and people also disagree on this because people also disagree on everything. Uh, and like Node.js really felt left behind uh, in that you know um, the atmosphere specification was focusing on, on the web, web browser side as, uh, only. So that they had problems. If you ever heard of like the MJS like file extension, whatever, you probably heard of this. Uh, and it was not ideal. Um, uh, but you had a lot of legacy code in the in a common JS format in npm already. You saw the red line. So there was kind of nothing to be done, except you know there are a lot of very smart people in the Node.js organization, and they eventually f figured out a way. So if uh, you haven't heard of this, I have good news for you. Uh, this is supposed to be landing in V12, so in like two weeks, uh, V12 version of Node.js will actually uh, have like a phase two implementation, uh, which is basically uh, practically common JS's legacy now. Uh, as in, there is complete and full co uh, cooperation between uh, uh, um, uh, CommonJS and, and ES modules. Uh, you still have to use the experimental flag for now, uh, but but every everybody you know uh, this is kind of like uh, everybody ate their their cabbage and also well I don't know how, how that how you say that in English in the first place. But yeah, so everybody was happy. Uh, well, well, at least like is happy seem to be happy with this. Uh, you still have to wait a bit, but that's kind of like, oh, everybody was very upset, and now they actually figured it out. So that's like a nice, cozy feeling, I guess. Um, but will it blend, or like, will it blend in? Because, you know, you're going to be using, uh, now you have browser side uh, ES module uh, modules, and you have Node.js side ES modules, but the problem is, they're going to work, like the syntax is going to work, but your modules may not work, because there's still a chasm between the two platforms, there's ch uh, still API differences. Uh, you can probably, like, deal away with them, with abstractions and whatever, but, but it's, uh, you'll have to work your ass off. Uh, so, who, who, who knows what this one is? You probably ran into this one. For, for folks in the back, like this is a no JIP error, uh, which what you get. Uh, so, so let's get into like details of it a bit, because like the no JIP error comes from, uh, Node.js allows you to compile native modules. And Node.js allows you to use native modules when you have to, when you need system access or you need like something uh, that is closer to the performance of native code. Uh, this error, the problem with that is, is these packages are downloaded in their source format and they end up being compiled on your machine, uh, taking up your uh, electricity and burning your CPU and uh, occasionally failing uh, while they do that on installation time of an application that you're trying to use, a module that you're trying to use. And you know, these things uh, are, are um, are getting like exacerbated when you're actually using Electron. Uh, there are like, various ways people have been trying. Yes, your slides. <laughs> I totally stole them. Uh, and uh, nice, nice illustrations. Uh, in any case, um, uh, the, these problems are exacerbated when you are using Electron because you have now not just Node.js, but also like a Chromium service that are interacting with each other in various ways. You have probably been here and saw uh, the mess that you can get out of this. And the thing is, like this kind of like dropping down to a lower level abstraction is like nothing new. 
like if you want to run like numeric calculations in Python, Python is going to include a binary module that is going to do it for you because it's just faster. And this is not news for any language. Node.js has it, Python has it, Ruby has it. Uh, the interesting part, so this is uh, Dan Callahan, a colleague of mine at uh, the Mozilla DevRel team talking at PyCon uh, about a possible way to fix this. And the possible way to fix this, you have already been introduced to this by Lynn until yesterday's web assembly. Now not, I literally have nine minutes, so I'm not going to be able to go into the details of what web assembly is, and, uh, but I definitely uh, want to kind of whet your appetite for it, because this might actually save your bacon if you have been doing uh, a lot of Node.js and a lot of binary modules lately. So the first thing, like um, Lynn mentioned this, like WebAssembly is an MVP, which means it, it is very minimal. And, uh, but there's already use cases that you can already use it for. Uh, if you ever installed Node.js on your machine, You've probably seen Node.js. You may uh, have been even like uh, bitten by it, or like uh, all kinds of Ruby games you had to install at some point. Um, what they're actually trying to do is replacing the binary modules of Node.js uh, in Node.js, uh, binary modules of uh, of SAS uh, in Node.js uh, with a WebAssembly dependency. The thing is, because WebAssembly uh, is a uh, is is coming from the JavaScript engine, the V8 engine supports it uh, since the V10 version. There is an experimental version of it, so they are actually working on it, uh, making sure that they can they can replace the binary code with the WebAssembly counterpart. The interesting part of this is WebAssembly you only compile once, and then you can run it on any device that that supports it and close to uh, or like or reasonably close to native native speeds. Um, which means that uh, V8 has a built-in WebAssembly uh, engine that will be able to run this like SAS interpreter for you. Um, now we are really getting into the weeds, so uh, uh, I'm really hoping a, a, a WebAssembly interstitial is not going to pop up on my screen. Uh, but we are going to go deeper because the thing is, uh, currently there is a lot of boilerplate that you have to apply to this. And Link Clark herself is the champion of a proposal that was that is going to make this even even easier. And the end result on the end goal is actually to make a WebAssembly modules just as easy to reuse and plop into your code as um, as normal JavaScript modules. Uh, so on the left hand side, or like my left hand side, uh, you see the current like boilerplate you need to import and and use a a WebAssembly module. Uh, Lynn's uh, uh, proposal, the champion, uh, the proposal that Lynn is championing, uh, makes it uh, automatically uh, WebAssembly modules being able to tap into the ES6 uh, module syntax, uh, which is a very important point because the idea is to create small WebAssembly modules that could replace, like surgically replace parts of the things that you actually want to uh, make sure that are running fast, or maybe you want to sh share some code between platforms. Make sure that you. Uh, you can have the absolute minimum size uh, of WebAssembly module compiled uh, targeted to this. Uh, what you see on the screen is like the uh, speed um, improvements that Mozilla Steam has got out of like uh, gener uh, using uh, WebAssembly and Rust, recreating the um, the mapping file parser of the Firefox developer tools. If you use Firefox, your developer tools runs JavaScript and React and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and it actually is going to use this WebAssembly module in the browser to make, I uh, think, 10 times uh, faster parsing of like you know, a three megabyte like mapping file bundle that your uh, favorite uh, code generator created. So this is this is a huge uh, difference, and it's embedded in a shipping product in 200 million computers. But you don't have to go that far. Uh, the Chrome team has a Scroosh app, uh, an image application named Scroosh. Uh, that actually they have been developing to kind of make like image manipulations and resizing and a bunch of other stuff like easier. So what they did is they have been experimenting with WebAssembly. They've been writing it for, uh, from scratch. And at some point they, they found this library. Uh, Piston is a Rust library uh, for uh, writing games and like native app, uh, like uh, multimedia applications. And the thing about Rust is they kind of have these small modules. Like everything is uh, like, whereas the, uh, it's kind of like, uh, Rust is like the Cinder Sorhus of the, uh, the ecosystem. They like use like super small modules and everything is reusable or like abstracted away sufficiently. So this gaming library has a library that can do image resizing and manipulations. They just took the library, used the Rust tool chain to compile it to WebAssembly, 
they got like a 10 kilobyte jo web assembly bundle uh, of a library that they could use to use all kinds of uh, resizing algorithms inside the application. And what um, uh, Jake Archibald also mentions here is that because they just code split this out, the application is still, uh, it, this adds 10 kilobyte to the final bundle, uh, the final download of the application, but the application is still 15 kilobytes like down the wire and until interactive, they can just load this like separately and, and you can use uh, this code that somebody else wrote in a completely different language uh, in your web application um, if you want to. Um, so I'm, uh, uh, what, I, what I'm kind of getting to is, is that experimentation is essential and I really am not, not here to, uh, uh, still, you know, I, I don't want, uh, I, what I usually say to people is like the, the uh, end goal of Electron is to not exist anymore. And I really don't want uh, Shelly to not have her job anymore. But th that's kind of the thing. Electron was uh, kind of the Node.js uh, uh, in the same, same vein, uh, like Node.js. Like people wanted to do more and people figured out a way to do more. But eventually what you see, uh, you know, just as it happened with jQuery, uh, you know, uh, uh, what people use and what people do, uh, eventually like kind of seeps back into the platform and is implemented right into the, the browser or the DOM API of your choice. And kind of, that is uh, the expectation of Electron as well. And I'm not just, want, I don't just want to talk in two years. Uh, last time I gave this talk in NodeConf Argentina, I couldn't really back this up. Uh, what you see on the uh, on the screen uh, last week, I was in Buenos Aires at a uh, at a workshop in uh, at a note, a note school workshop. Now, wh what I can tell you, it's very hard to teach people Node.js if you don't speak their language. So maybe think about that the next time you try this. Uh, but what I saw is Alejandro, uh, who was speaking here yesterday about uh, uh, black holes, but also the Node.js ecosystem. Uh, he installed a bunch of like Docker containers uh, serving you off basically what is Visual Studio Code into a browser. Now Visual Studio Code or Atom or whatever has been uh, uh, has been quite a feat to pull off. And you really need uh, the speed of Chrome or the, render, the modern rendering of engines to pull off the UI. And you really needed to have like something in the background that you could use uh, to your, uh, run your uh, JavaScript or CoffeeScript, God forbid. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, what really made it possible, uh, Visual Studio, Code is probably uh, I think is still like the biggest like um, GitHub uh, repository on Earth at this point, and they just took it and they figured out a way how to run it in in the browser. I I want to point out this is Firefox, like Chrome, uh, like uh, Electron embeds like the Chromium engine, and the UI is actually running in Firefox. What they did is basically just rewired the the uh, backend code of this application to instead of like going to the file system directly uh, or uh, using the Node.js application uh, that's behind it, it basically goes to a server. Now the problem with the server is obviously they figured out a way how to like emulate this like file system behind this, uh, behind this uh, whole thing. And uh, what you see on, this, uh, on the screen is a Mozilla experiment uh, that actually puts, um, uh, puts uh, scientific computing into your, your computer uh, but the interesting part of this, this is kind of like Ju Jupyter Notebooks on like steroids. Jupyter Notebooks is basically, uh, Ajana used this for her Lambda presentation. Uh, I was like, oh, that, that looked really cool. The problem is that actually depends on running a server in the background uh, uh, and like, the server el evaluating your files uh, in the background for you. Uh, because uh, even if you could do JavaScript on the client side, uh, a lot of Jupyter Notebooks run. Python or, or uh, Ruby or a bunch of other languages. What you see here, the iodide app actually uh, is a Mozilla experiment when they took the uh, R programming language runtime and they compiled it to WebAssembly. So then uh, the iodide UI is basically a Jupyter notebook that pulls in the WebAssembly file for, uh, for uh, for the R compiler, and you can do like visualizations completely uh, separate from a server. And uh, my, my friend I mentioned, uh, Dan Kellan at PyCon, actually shows you a Python interpreter in the browser. Now, I'm not saying you should do this, but it is pretty cool to be collaborating uh, on a browser uh, on near native speeds in your browser without having to install any uh, desktop applications. And, uh, but the problem here is the same. Like somebody had to re-implement the backend of this. 
And this is what kind of the VASI team is trying to figure out is like, it's like early standardizing the, the ways people could interact using WebAssembly to the system. Uh, so uh, like the uh, uh, code IO, coder IO team had to re-implement the backend, like the file backend of the file. Uh, the IODI team kind of had to figure out, uh, figure it out how to make it work, make these things work. And they all f uh, figured out their own abstractions. Uh, what the VASI team is trying to do is kind of channel the WebAssembly specification, which is in a sandbox. So all the security problems that you get from other native technologies don't, don't really apply, or not as much. And just channel all those, um, uh, all those if, uh, efforts of using like native file systems or network connections into a, a well-defined interface. And the, only, uh, the, the way they can actually make this work is actually uh, WASI uses uh, uh, a permission system that is a capability-based uh, permission system. That means the, the, WASI, uh, the WASI supporting WebAssembly binary you are using can only use the things that you give it access to. If you're going to pass in a file, it can use the file, but not the directory the file is in. If you pass in a directory, it can use the directory, but not, uh, not the, the uh, maybe you pass in a read-only directory, uh, so it cannot write into the directory. What you see on uh, the stage, there is a video uh, from Link Clark, who introduces this technology, and what you see here is a Vasi uh, runtime actually forbids access to the etc slash password file on the user's computer because your code didn't uh, give it access to. And this is something interesting that we are also seeing in, um, uh, in other ways, uh, other experiments going on. So, so Node.js and, and Electron wasn't the last experiment. And if you heard of Dino, uh, Ryan Dahl's uh, TypeScript-based like, um, systems engine, uh, what uh, Guy Bedford says here in this comment uh, is that Dino is doing something something really interesting, and we should be keeping our eyes on that because these kind of experience we can learn a lot from. And what you're going to see here, so Dino uh, is actually going to run a server here. It's kind of like a hello world example. Uh, so what Dino will do, do is actually ask you if you want to ex uh, give permission to the app to connect to the internet. Uh, and what it will, what you do, uh, don't see on this picture is actually uh, every dependency. Uh, will only get uh, the permissions that you give them. So if you pull in a random module that wants to write your, erase your computer, Dino will ask you, unless you preemptively t tell them not to do that or like give permissions ahead of, of time, that this module can write into like format my, my, my hard disk. So this is kind of an experiment, obviously, but this is something that you can, you can see all over the place, is that kind of the current like, practices are not cutting it, and people are experimenting with these, uh, uh, with these experiences. Uh, so yeah, so if you haven't checked it out, it's really interesting uh, to see uh, in a kind of like, you know, uh, a way how, where is, where is the, the technology of the future headed. So that's a lot of things, right? That's a lot of amazing technology, but I really wanted to leave you with, with, with one thought, um, which we had, I, I kind of get this like every single talk I give, um, and I kind of, this is the same thing I tell, uh, tell these people. So we had a panel uh, at NodeCon for Argentina, and somebody asked us the question, should I be using Node.js in production? Like, do you, do you think it's fine to be using Node.js in production? Now. It, that may sound like a silly question, really, because like I just told you, like Node.js is 10 years old. Uh, it's kind of backed by a bunch of companies and like uh, the JavaScript Foundation. Uh, but the thing, the bad news is basically nobody should tell you if you should use a tool or not. Like you will have to figure it out yourself because whether or not you should use a tool depends on you know your constraints and not how people uh, people uh, think about that. So uh, on this panel, we had something similar uh, with Sus, uh, Sus Hinton Nupcat reiterate on the JS Party podcast. I'll link to the full podcast, uh, but what she says is uh, what's the really important part. I think what you can do is respect that you won't be able to, do, to know everything. And I think you should all respect that because it's, uh, it's going to put you in a very bad place if you're going to try it. Uh, what she also says, I think you need to respect that you need several people all working together who are good at different things in order to produce the best quality output. And you don't have to know everything, uh, but what you have to do is you have to, uh, further on on the podcast she also talks about that, you have to play with things. 
If you're not going to discover new things, you're not going to know if you're going to need them or if you want to use them. Don't use your new library on like a client project like in, in production, like the first time you use it. You have to play with it first with Code Sandbox or something uh, <laughs> and, and play it really early and often. Like, Try WebAssembly, try the new stuff that comes out. You know, don't try to know everything, but you know, if this sounds interesting, spend some time on it and you know, try it out. Uh, don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. And very important, I'm not telling you that you should do this on your free time. I'm not telling you you should be coding um, morning and, and evening and weekends, that you should spend your weekends trying to figure this out. If you're in a good place, in a good company, uh, they should give you, this is what they call research and development time, when you should be able to improve your skills. So if you are somebody who, who are not yet burnt out of management, but still in management, build a team with different strengths. Like figure out how to build a team that, you know, when, when, uh, when, when put together, they are more than the sum of its parts. And identif identify the pr problems and find the right people to solve them and find the right tools to solve them. So kind of build your own tool belt and don't ask other people you know, whether you should be using a tool or not. Thank you very much. <laughs> Awesome. You will see the link to the slides on the, on the list. Uh, if you go one slide before, uh, after, there's a reading list if you want to learn more of these technologies. Uh, you will find me at SL Softworks, and at MossHex is the Mozilla Developer Teams maintained like Twitter channel about new cool stuff on the web. So uh, check those out. Thank you.